All right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started. It's good to see you today. Glad you're here. And uh, just go over a, a couple things. First, I have our, our missionary letter. It's from the Jehovah Jireh Foundation, which, of course, helps uh, uh, churches of like faith buy buildings. And um, Brother Boss, he writes, I pray all is well with you and your family during these uh, trying times. Uh, let's remember that God is still in control as we ask for his guidance. I thank you for your faithful support to Jehovah Jireh Foundation and your desire to further the gospel. My desire is for Jehovah Jireh Foundation to be perpetual. With this thought in mind, I've appointed Dr. Lou Rossi, Jr., pastor of Granite Baptist Church in Glen Burnie, Maryland, to be the president. I will now serve as the founder of Jehovah Jireh Foundation as he takes the role of president. Uh, Dr. Rossi loves the Lord and has faithfully served him for over 40 years. He's well known and respected among independent Baptist churches. This decision was made after much prayer, counsel, and thought. I believe this move would be pleasing to the Lord. Please keep Dr. Rossi in your prayers that he will keep our Lord first uh, in all through he does in Jehovah Jireh. And uh, so, um, and then they give an update on 15 churches that they were able to help. Um, I actually know four of them. There was uh, Anchor Baptist in um, uh, New York. Uh, James Nero actually pr presented here. We never were able to take him on, but he did present here, and he's doing well. And then um, uh, Trevor Martin in uh, Big Timber, Mo Montana. Uh, they helped them buy a building, and I went to, I didn't go to school with him. He started after me. We went to the same college, um, and I know him. Um, yeah, both of his parents go to Calvary, where I went to Bible college. And then another graduate at the same school I went to, he graduated before I was there, but his name is Andrew uh, uh, Shank uh, in Blair, Nebraska. They helped him. And then Community Baptist over in Lawrence with Brother Nick. So I um, was uh, so glad they're uh, helping out. And there were several other churches uh, that they helped out. I do want to remind everybody on their missions cards, we want to get these in. And, I want to, and I'll be uh, really emphasizing this over the next two weeks is if you've never been involved in missions, well, first tithe, okay, get that principle of giving down, and then if you've never, t uh, well, if you've never tithed, start doing that. But if you are tithing, then uh, give something to missions. Uh, everything, and something is better than nothing. Now, if you've already given to missions, here's the challenge: grow in your faith. All right, give more than you did last year. God provided, okay. He provided. You made it. You didn't lose your home. All right. So give more. Ask God to grow your faith. As and, and again, you don't have to. You don't have to. You know, be ridiculous. But just ask God. Well, God, grow my faith. What do you want me to give that's growing my faith? All right. So um, you just rip this off, put it in the offering plate, and uh, that would be wonderful. All right. Now we are in our series on Bible prophecy, but we are now going to change gears. And uh, look at the nation of Israel, all right? There's a lot of prophecy about the nation of Israel. In fact, it's been said that prophecy can't be understood without first understanding Israel. In God's prophetic plan through the ages, the nation of Israel, Israel figures at the very heart of the coming world events. And, and the matter of Israel's present and future role in God's scheme is a major point of contention between the pre-millennial position and the post- and amillennial position. And so we're going to emphasize a lot of key scriptures and look at several different things over several weeks as we consider the nation of Israel. And so let's start off by all turning to the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 7. <coughs> and uh, uh, do pray for me. I've been having a little bit of a respiratory issue this morning, a little tight and... Uh, I took some uh, uh, an inhaler, and I'm hoping that it helps. So, um, and uh, I'm asking prayer that you would help me to remember to take the regular medication I'm supposed to take. All right, and uh, it's just it's new for me, and and so I am having a hard. It's not much. It's supposed to take like an allergy pill, you know, those little tiny ones, and then Flovent. Uh, 
and I keep forgetting to do it, and 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 so uh, then I have breathing problems, and, and so it's not much sympathy that goes around when you're not doing what you're supposed to do. Okay, I understand that, so I'm not looking for sympathy. I'm asking for prayer for me to remember. Okay, and uh, and and then when if that doesn't work, then feel bad for me. Okay, all right, then you feel bad for me, and. Uh, uh, but, you know, you can actually, I can make an argument, you can feel bad for me that I've got so much to remember that I just can't even remember to, to do the <laughs> basic things to take care of myself. Uh, yeah, I know, I know. Don't go taking things I say and use them against me. And uh, you'll remember what's important to you. I know, I know. I've said that. It's true. All right, we're moving on. Um, so let's talk about the nation of Israel. First, we're going to see that uh, Israel is a chosen nation, right? And they are a chosen nation by the grace of God. If you look at Deuteronomy chapter 7, and look with me at verse 6. It says, For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto him, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you because ye were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would, have, uh, he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out of the mighty hand, out with a mighty hand, and redeemed you out of the house of bondage from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. You can stay in the same chapter and flip over to chapter 14, if you would. Chapter 14, in verse 2, says this. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all the nations that are upon the earth. Now, up until Genesis chapter 11, God is dealing with mankind in general. He's dealing with all of humanity. But at a certain point in Genesis chapter 11, I believe verse 9, uh, God allows humanity to go its own way. Uh, and let me get some readers here. I need some readers. Who'd like to read for me? Aaron, I'm going to have you go to Acts 14, verse 6. Um, can I have uh, one more reader, and then we'll all turn to another section in a little bit. Mark, um, can you go to Amos 3, verse 2, all right? Amos 3, verse 2, and, uh, and then in a few moments, we're all going to turn to uh, Romans chapter 9, all right? We're all going to turn to Romans 9 and read something. And uh, I do pray for Joe, being he's preaching up at Stateline Baptist Church today, and uh, I probably gave you a little heart attack. I, I, I meant to text Joe Bean, and I checked Joel, text Joel Roberts and said, hey, I, uh, I've, I got you know, a service for you up at State Line on Sunday. And, uh, you <laughs> and then I didn't, I didn't realize I sent it to him. So like, ah, oh, he doesn't, re you know, normally Joe's like right on top of that. He loves it. And, and then I look back at my phone. I'm like, oh, I text Joel. And uh, I said, oh, sorry, wrong person. And, uh, but anyhow, uh, he's up there today. Mark will be up there next Sunday uh, covering their services, so be praying for these folks. But what I want you to see here is that God, at a certain point, let uh, humanity uh, go its own way. Go ahead and read Acts 14, verse 16. I don't think that's the right one. Is it Acts 14, 16? I might have said six. I apologize. Okay. So he allowed the nations to walk in their own way. So there was a time, and I know that like we think, oh, it's only 11 chapters. Yeah, but it's actually thousands of years of human history that God worked through all people. And then at a certain point said, you know what? Do what you want. I'm going to work with a family. And out of the many nations that are described in Genesis chapter 10, which 
really all of your modern nations today have their roots going back to Genesis 10. Out of all those nations, God chose to work through one family, and that's Amos 3.2. Go ahead and read that. Okay, not a real happy thought, but in, in the latter beginning part, he says, only you, uh, you only have I known of all the families. God chose to work through a family. And really, when you understand the heart of God, it's to reach others. All right? See, God works through his church right now. Now, what, what's our purpose? To reach others. Okay, so God works with the group to reach the world. And he worked through the nation of Israel that started as a family. And so when we consider the ancestry of Israel, what you have, have is you have Adam, Seth, I'm skipping you know, a few, but Noah, Shem, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Out of Jacob would come the 12 tribes of Israel, Joseph's, uh, family would be divided into two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim. And the choosing of the nation is a remarkable testimony to the sovereignty of God, that God chose the lineage of Seth over Cain, and God chose the lineage of Shem uh, over Ham and Japheth, and God chose the, uh, Abram over Haran and and Isaac over Ishmael, and Jacob over Esau. Uh, let's turn to Romans 9, all right? Let's all turn there. Romans 9, and let's look at uh, verse 6, all right? I'm going to do a little reading here. Romans 9 and verse 6. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are Israel, are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are children of the flesh. These are not the children of God, but the children of promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise at this time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done anything good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It is said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Now, what this passage, and we're not going to, there's so much in there to, to parse out. And, and it would take much, much time. But the passage um, does not teach that God chooses between individuals in the matter of salvation. See, this is where people go astray when, they're, when they begin to think of the concepts of the sovereignty of God. It, you know, it's like if you use the word sovereignty, people think, oh, you're a Calvinist. No, it's a biblical term, all right? That, that God is sovereign all-powerful, okay? He's, he's sovereign over all. There's nothing. We don't need to be afraid of that. And God does choose. But the problem is people ascribe this concept of choosing to individuals in the matter of salvation, which is absolutely not what the Bible teaches, all right? What this is teaching here is God chose who made up the Israel's lineage? Everybody can be saved, but he chose whom he would select to be the lineage of Israel and ultimately the lineage of the Messiah. Now, an illustration to show that the Jews have no inherent 
This is also an illustration here to show them that the Jews have no inherent right to salvation. What was one of the problems with Israel at the time of Christ? They were God's chosen people. For what purpose? To tell the world about God. That's not what they did. Instead, they thought, we're God's chosen people. God only loves us. We're saved, and you're all damned to hell. And, and we're not going to... We're not going to, you know, try to tell you what happened. Abigail's phone, I request. <laughs> so do we decline her, block her, or accept her? I don't know if we should put her phone up there. And, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So how does that, I don't know how that happens. Are we trying? We can't even decline you. Look at that. They're trying. I see the, I see the thing. And uh, trying to tie into our smart TV. Well, that, no, no, don't. This is good. I love this stuff, all right? This is good. You're on a roll. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. And uh, what's that? Oh, yes, no problem. We, we, you know, in a Bible-believing church, we want to help one another, all right? We're, you know, we're our brother's keeper, okay? And uh, so uh, that's wonderful. What, what happened? You got blocked? Wow. Well, that's not what we wanted to do. We didn't want to block you, but apparently you got blocked. That's all right. My mom defriended me on Facebook. She defriended me and blocked me. I know, I know. Although I, although I, it, I did block her on my phone. I don't know how I did it. Recently, I was like, man, well, I thought, I, like, I'm texting her and she's not responding. And I was like, all right, well, whatever. I guess she's turning into a moody old lady, you know, and <laughs> not even responding. That's what I thought. Like, she's not responding to my text. Like, eh, whatever. And then, uh, yeah, did I, did I say this? Yeah. Yeah, I was like, I don't know what's up with her. And, uh, right. I was, and here's, she's like, yeah, she did. I'm like, oh, what? That's where I didn't get it. So I go on my phone, and apparently I, I blocked her. Huh? Oh, anyhow. Oh no, that's all right. This is all. This is, this is all of the Lord, sort of, probably, maybe. Anyhow, that's all right. Does anybody else want to sign into the? the you know, we'll just block everybody. All right. But, uh, all right. Very good. So, we see that um, in Matthew three nine. Uh, let, let me get. Let me get some readers. Who'd like to read for me? Uh, I know Eric. I saw your hand earlier. Can you go to Matthew three verse nine? Give me. Um, I need three, two more, two more readers. Joel, Colossians, no, not Colossians. Isaiah 45, 4. Megan, you're going to read Isaiah 65, verses 9 and then 22, okay? So I want you to see here that the Jews thought they had this inherent right to salvation because they were Jewish. It's like somebody who grows up in church thinks that they're just owed salvation because they're in church. It's the, 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 the Catholic mentality. Well, I'm, I deserve uh, heaven because I'm a Catholic. All right? That meant that, and, and, and you can apply that to any group, by the way. All right? Not just Catholics. Any group that thinks, oh, I'm this, therefore I deserve heaven. Now, Matthew 3, 9. Go ahead and read that. All right, so what they're saying is they're, basically they're alluding to the fact that, that they're special because they're descendants of Abraham. And in a sense they were, but they're not, uh, they had no inherent right to salvation just because of their lineage. Let me tell you, I, I've heard uh, Christians brag about, you know, I'm a seventh generation Christian. Well, whoop de do. Like, what difference does that make? Like, praise God for a godly heritage. Okay, fine. But just because your great-great-great-grandfather went to church doesn't mean that you're doing right. And, and so, you know, 
Look, I've seen plenty of people that grew up in pastor's homes and, and have a family heritage that just don't do what the Bible says. And then you get another person who's come from all sorts of ungodliness and they start doing what the Bible says and God uses that person more than the person who grew up in a good home. Because it's not about where you grew up. It's about what you do with what the Word of God says. You either follow it or you don't. And God uses the ones that follow it and the ones that don't, He doesn't. And it's as simple as that. And just because you come from a good background doesn't mean that you're better with God. It has absolutely no bearing. Now, in the matter of salvation, God has chosen to save all people who put their faith in Jesus Christ. All right, That's what we have to understand. So God can pick and choose who is he going to use for the lineage all right, in a nation. But that has nothing to do with salvation. Now, as God's chosen people, Israel is God's elect. All right, again, now that term elect, don't be scared by it. It's in the Bible. Properly, biblically understand it. It's not that God, it's not that God, election is not saved, 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 lost, lost, saved, lost. God's not, that's not election. All right? Israel is God's elect. They are his chosen people. Uh, Isaiah 45, 4. Go ahead. Who's up on that? Joel, are you up? That's okay. Forty-five, four. All right, he says, you're my elect. I have chosen you a nation. They were elected of God for a purpose as a nation. This is not dealing with individual people. It is dealing with a nation that has been chosen to accomplish a purpose. I, Isaiah 65, verse 9 first, Megan. Drop down and read verse 22, if you would. They shall not build, and another inhabit. They shall not plant, and another eat. For the days of the tree are the days of my people, and my elect shall long enjoy the work of my hands. All right, so we see he's, you are my chosen people. This is what I'm doing for you. Again, not dealing with individuals, but the nation as a whole. I need, let's see here, three more readers who'd like to read for me today. I need all of you to be involved, so... Don't wait. Beth Ann, uh, Deuteronomy 32, 10. Give me two more. Give me two more. There we go. Pam, it's good to see you back. And uh, Lamentations 2, 18. All right. And Sam, uh, Zechariah 2, 8. All right. And don't worry. I have more reading. All right. And there's plenty more. So we'll just do little bits at a time because you never know when we're going to get sidetracked or, or start having to block somebody else on the TV, all right? We never know what's going to happen, okay? Now, we're going to see that they, Israel is the apple of God's eye. Uh, Deuteronomy 32.10. The apple of his eye, okay? And we see this term repeatedly, Lamentations 2.18. It's okay. All right, so the apple of thine eye is again a reference to Israel. Of course, Lamentations is basically the judgment of. of well, God, but really it's the Babylonians that have destroyed Jerusalem. Jeremiah is left behind in lamenting what has become of their city and their people. And, uh, and, and he says, basically, let not the apple of thine eye, Israel, cease. And then Zechariah 2, 8, go ahead. Again, those that affected Israel are uh, affecting the apple of his eye. Now, there's 
much confusion that comes about when we fail to distinguish how the word elect is used in the New Testament. All right? So we see in the Old Testament that Israel is the elect of God. They're the apple of his eye. But we need to discern how it's used in the New Testament. So I'm going to need some readers here who would like to help with me. All right. Help me out here. All right. Jay, Matthew 24 in verse number 22. Give me one more. One more. Gene, there we go. 2 Timothy 2 verses 10. If there are others, I have more to give. All right. Let's see. I could give out two more right now if I have a willing. Mark. And Tim, all right, Mark, Colossians 3.12, Tim, 1 Peter 1, 2, all right? Now, first, sometimes in the New Testament, the word elect is actually referencing Israel, all right? So the term elect in the Old Testament is referencing Israel. Sometimes in the New Testament, it's talking about Israel as well. Matthew 24.22, go ahead and read that. Who did I have reading that? Oh, go ahead. Okay, now when we understand and rightly divide the word of truth, and I'm going to tell you right now, where everybody gets messed up, anybody who has a, a post-tribulational view, all right, they do not properly interpret Matthew 24 and 25. The first thing you have to understand is the gospel of Matthew is the gospel to the Jews. Each gospel kind of has its own focal point. Luke is the gospel to the Gentiles. All right. Mark is a gospel to, and this sounds weird, but like servants. But when half the people were slaves in that day, it actually was a real group of people. And then John is the gospel to the world at large. Okay. Matthew, um, Luke, and Mark cover all the major groups with a focal point, and then John's, those are what are called the synoptic gospels. They're very similar, but they do have different mindsets in mind. The gospel of John is to everybody, and, and of course, we can benefit from all of them. But when you read Matthew 24 and 25, it's talking about Israel. That's very important to understand, because if you start making that the church, you're going to have a lot of theological problems. So the elect here is Israel. 2 Timothy 2, 10. Go ahead and read that. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Okay, so we've got to stop right there. He says, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they might obtain salvation. This means that the elect in this verse are not saved. So that's not talking about born-again believers. Unless you're going down the, the rabbit hole of Calvinism, where God's already saved them, but they don't know it. But even then, that doesn't work with that verse because he says they're not saved. In the Calvinistic theology, basically God regenerates you and you come to understand that salvation. So you're already saved, you just don't know it. And your, your, what we would call salvation is you recognizing what God already did which I don't subscribe to that at all. Now, we do find that elect is talked about, when we do see in other places that the elect are believers. But in this instance, we see that it's talking about a group of elect people who are not yet saved. And of course, when you understand the heart of Paul, he wished himself a curse that the people of Israel could be saved, his people. And so the term elect here is dealing with the nation of Israel that was not believing in Jesus as Messiah. All right, so you got to read into the context, you got to look at. But we also see that other times it's used to describe Christians. Colossians 3 12. So he's talking to save people, he calls them the elect of God. When you accept Christ as Savior, many things happen. Many, many things happen. And, and one of them is you become a part of the, or you become the elect, the chosen of God. Think of it like this. 
You didn't save yourself. When you exhibit faith in Jesus, God saves you. It is a response of God to your faith. That God has said, I will always do it. And he chooses you. Not because he has to, but because he wants to and said he would. That any person that comes unto him by faith, believing in the gospel message, he will redeem. And you become the elect of God. Chosen of him. Because you didn't earn it. You're not good enough to get to heaven, but God chose you in response to your faith. Now, that's not predetermined, all right? Now, without bending your mind too much, okay, is God uh, sovereign in the sense of he knows who will and will not accept him? Yes. Why? God's outside of time. He created time. Therefore, time is not irrelevant it's irrelevant he is outside of it so he knows what you'll choose before you choose it and the bible indicates he also knows what would have happened if you had chosen differently now that's not like multiverse stuff okay but in a roundabout way it in other words he knows how the world would have been had people chosen differently. It doesn't actually exist. But in his sovereignty, he knows exactly what would have transpired if you had chosen a different path that he knew you would not choose. Because nobody will stand before God and say, he's wrong, or not right, or not fair. The truth is, Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. That means the people who are lost in hell for all eternity are not going to be mad at God, but they'll acknowledge that he is right. Because they will see all things. They'll see the opportunities they had that they did not take. First uh, Peter chapter 1, verse 2, go ahead. Okay, elect to the foreknowledge of God. Now, but foreknowledge. Oh, there it is. There it is. Let me let me let me explain something. I used to record all the Patriots games. And and I wouldn't talk to anybody. I mean, when I, because, you know, it's really a four o'clock game. I wouldn't talk to anybody. Don't tell me, no. I mean, I had, for a while, I had everybody trained. I, I couldn't look at her. I couldn't make eye contact with her because I could read her face. I had to make sure that my radio was off before I got out of the car because if I came on, I could hear by the tone of the, the announcers of whether they were. I mean, man, I had this thing down. But inevitably, Nine times out of ten, I already knew. So now, I'll still record the game. But I find out the score first. And I only watch it if they win. <laughs> but I want you to know something. My foreknowledge of what's going to happen on that TV is in no way causative. I know what's going to happen. I know the end score. I can look at the stats and I can know exactly how many uh, passes are going to be thrown, how much yardage uh, uh, will be thrown, how many touchdowns there will be. I know how many interceptions and sacks there will be. But I did not cause any of it. God says... I will choose any who choose to believe in my son. And I will make them my elect, my people. 
And I know who will do that. But it's their choice. It's not God, God arbitrarily selecting some to salvation and some to damnation. That is not the God of the Bible. That is not the God I know. That is a cruel God. And I don't believe that that is the heart of God at all. I do believe I'm elect. I believe he chose me because I believed in him. And he knows what we'll do before we do it, but we have choice. In other words, you can change your path. Think about it in the reverse way. God knows what your life would have been if you didn't listen to him. He knows exactly what would have transpired. Now, the term elect is also used to describe angels. Uh, who would like to read for me a verse about angels? Are you reading? Good. First Timothy 5.21. I need uh, one more reader. Sam, First Peter 2.6. All right. So, elect is sometimes talked about the angels. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 21. Jen, go ahead. Okay, so the elect angels. Well, how did the, how, who are the elect angels? Did they, Mark, go ahead. That's right. See, God, at a certain point in time, gave the angels a choice. Now, you've got to understand something. You and I, there's a lot of mystery about God. I mean, there's things that we just don't know. Angels aren't that way. They've got it. Full, full revelation, full understanding. They can be in his presence. They understand. Uh, they were there at creation. All right? When, when he made the earth, the angels were already in existence because they all rejoice at creation. So somewhere between the creation of everything, time, space, and matter, and the fall of man, somewhere in that window... There was the war in heaven, according to Revelation chapter 12. And a third of the angels fell in rebellion. And the ones that did not rebel became the elect angels. There are other angels that we would call demons, but they are technically angels. And there's different classes of them and so on. So there's elect angels, chosen of God. All right, we see that even Jesus Christ is also called elect. 1 Peter 2, 6. Okay, so... The chief cornerstone, and I didn't give you the verse, but we can cross-reference that terminology, is a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see here that he is what? Elect. Chosen of, of God for the purpose of the cross, which he willingly went to. So what happens is this. We see in the New Testament this term elect is used four different ways. So you got to pay attention to who it's talking about. Now, if you just take the term elect and say in the New Testament, oh, that's the church. You're going to have problems when you start fitting that in to all the times that the word elect is used, aren't you? So when you just assume that the term elect is dealing with the church, you're going to start confusing Israel with the church, especially in the Gospels, and that has led to incorrect interpretations of prophetic passages. So you can see very clearly how understanding context, reading it, 
is very important when we deal with certain terms. And I promise you, people that are, I, I absolutely 100%, no question about it, if you're watching YouTube or listening to somebody and they go to a post-trib or mid-trib or pre-wrath view, I promise you they are going to go to Matthew 24 and 25 as their proof text. Promise it. Mark it down. Why? Because it's the only place they can go. It's the only place they can go, and they have to put Israel, I'm sorry, they have to put church in the place of Israel. It's the only way you can make it work. But it's not the right interpretation. And so we want to be very careful. Now, I want you to see God's purpose in choosing Israel. First, uh, and I already uh, 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 Let's see here. Let's all turn to, let's just all turn to Deuteronomy 4, all right? We're all going to all go turn to a few places, give you guys a little bit of break. Deuteronomy 4. So the first purpose in choosing Israel was to declare the true God to all the nations. Deuteronomy 4, and look with me at verse uh, 6. It says, keep therefore and do them. For this is your wisdom and understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that hath the statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law, which I set before you this day. So what they're saying here is this. Live by my law, and I will bless you, and all the nations will see you and be amazed, and they will desire what you have. And is not Israel perfectly placed in ancient times as the crossroads for the whole world? If you were going to travel to Asia from Africa, you had to go through Israel. If you were going to travel from Europe to go down into Africa or Asia, you had to go through Israel. It was at the crossroads of humanity. So everybody in trade routes would come through Israel as they went through the whole known world. And the idea was that they would be perfectly placed so that the people would see them and be amazed. Over in Isaiah 43, verses 9 through 12, it says this. Well, let me turn, let me get over there. All right, Isaiah 43. Beginning in verse 9. Let all the nations be gathered together and let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us the former things? Let them bring forth their witnesses that they may be justified. Or let them hear and say it is truth. You're my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there is... There was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. I have declared, and I have saved, and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, that I am God. Well, okay, he's very clearly saying to Israel, you are my witnesses. To who? The world. They already know. You're my witnesses to the world. Uh, turn, flip over to chapter 44. Chapter 44, and look at verse 6. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God, and who, as I, shall call and declare it and set it in order for me, since I have appointed the ancient people. 
and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show unto them. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. I have not told thee from that time and have declared it. Or have I not told thee from that time and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. Again, he says, I'm the witness. You're my witnesses that I'm the only God. All right. So what were many of the surrounding nations at the time? Polytheistic. And so they are witnesses of what? There's one God, which was a relatively speaking foreign concept in that day. That there was a singular God. And so we see that uh, we're about out of time, but uh, I'll give you I'll give you this. Um, God's purpose in choosing Israel was first for them to declare the truth to all nations. And then we will get into the fact that they were uh, to be a channel for which God would give the word of God. They were to be the channel for which the Savior, the Messiah, Jesus, would come. They were there to be a channel for God's government on earth. That hasn't happened yet, by the way. All right? But these are all things that the nation of Israel, and amongst other things that we'll get into. But let's have a word of prayer as we dismiss for Sunday school. Father, I pray that you bless the service to follow. Thank you for the opportunity to learn about Israel. I like this so much better than what we were covering last week. Father, I pray that you would just bless the service to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.